Well, hello, Korea. I'm uh, very excited to be here. My name is Brian Samboden. I work for Integralis Software in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, the desert, really hot. No snow, no cold. My Twitter handle is uh, BSBowden, so if you want to uh, follow me there, or I post all the code, every sample, that, uh, everything that I do, I announce it on Twitter. So today, I'm going to talk about server-side push. And before we start talking about server-side push, we have to understand where we came from and how it all started. We started with HTTP. Uh, you all look very young, but you might remember when we were doing desktop applications only. Client server, Delphi, VV, uh, Paradox, databases, in apps, nothing else. No web servers, no internet, no wires. But then they gave us HTTP. Uh, a very good uh, and nice, kind gentleman from England called Tim Berners-Lee gave us HTTP. And we thought, oh, this, this has got to be easy. Uh, we can figure this out. You send a request, you get a response, you paint something, you're done. Easy. Huh? So it was pretty good for a while. Until it, it was good for documents. So you remember you had a single page, it was all text. You had an HTML document, you served it, done, finished, no problem, easy. But um, that scaled pretty well because the documents were single units. You can have one server, you can replicate. Remember REST, HTTP, GET, you can cache the content. Many, many different users could read it. It could be cached in content servers. The web scaled that way, and it became what it is today, a very large collection of documents at some point. But there were no applications. It was just documents. Until your boss, or my boss, came and told me, Remember that client server application we had? I want you to rewrite it using this new HTML, HTTP technology. Can be easy, huh? should be. We have the database, we have the old designs, go ahead and do it. And we found that that was pretty hard because uh, we were dealing with the page by page model. It meant that our client sent a request, that's uh, Lucille Ball, and the server had to do many things before it could return the content. It typically had to hit a database, had to retrieve data from a database. It had to create the markup. And if you remember, we typically were concatenating strings of HTML, and we had to escape characters, and it was really, really bad back then. CGI scripts. We had to uh, get all the assets, images, sound files, uh, the ugly backgrounds from the web pages in the 1990s, and then, we can send the response back. So it took a long time. Typically, by the time that you got your response, you were twiddling your thumbs on the, on the desk. And we have modems, remember? We have to put the phone on a device to actually get on the internet. You remember your parents saying, get off the internet, I have to use the phone. So then, we came up with Ajax, and we decided users now want to have applications. We want to sell them things. We want them to do a lot of activities that we cannot afford to have a full page refresh. So we had Ajax. And with Ajax, we ask for everything on the, in the background. We say, hey, nothing is happening. We're going to send a request on the background, get information, and only change the parts of the page that were relevant. So if you have, for example, a table with records, and there was an X to close or delete the record, when you click on that X, just that part of the page will disappear. So we have an approach where we have short burst of requests. Something happened on the client. We send a mini request to the server. The server cooked some information for us and sent it back. And again, and again, and again. From the user's perspective, the experience was better. But the servers were being bombarded by our requests. So this was the beginning of the web as an application platform. And things changed radically because of that. Now a web developer was no longer a document creator, but was an application creator. So things got better until that boss came to you again and said, how about 
Now, instead of asking for things, the server can send things to the client directly. And you went, oh no. Complexity, again. So we have push, the push technologies out there. Server push, uh, server side push, there's many names for this type of technique. Why do we need them? We need them for things like collaboration. If you have a uh, project tracker that you're working all together, you wanna see your teammates' updates to the tracker. Chat, this is a typical application that you would have now. Uh, Facebook has chat, pretty much every social platform has a chat interface. Comments, you wanna add a comment to something, you wanna see it real time appear to the rest of the users. Notifications, uh, the server is down, the build fail, all those things you wanna be able to send them from the server right away instead of waiting for the user to have to refresh the page or actually click a button to ask for the information again. Bidding platforms, eBay, um, places like that, they need to have almost real-time communication from the server to the client. Monitor, uh, I mentioned build systems, uh, server farms. You wanna know if a rack, uh, it's not working anymore. You wanna know if a disk has died. You need to have that information as soon as possible so you can react appropriately. Stocks, money, money always makes things go faster. <laughs> and scores, if you like games, soccer, football, you need to have the ability to see those scores really fast so you can make fun of the other team faster. In games, games are very heavy when it comes to communications. You wanna have the movement of one player be reflected on the other player's browser as soon as possible. So push, it's any technique that allows bi-directional, two-way communication, that it's asynchronous, that it's almost real time, and that it's server initiated. And I have the asterisk in there because you always have to have the initial handshake with the server, and then everything can start from the server. So that type of communication, it's uh, not that easy to implement because until fairly recently, until just you know, maybe two or three years ago, browsers really sucked. And if, uh, let me see a show of hands, how many of you are web developers? I'm sorry. <laughs> so you always have to deal with Firefox and Chrome trying to outstage each other and IE always being behind the scenes, ruining everything for everybody. <laughs> so until recently, we had to hack it. We had to write a lot of JavaScript code, a lot of server-side code to make things work. And before I jump into the new technologies, I wanna show you the path that actually I have traveled myself to learn how to deal with server-side push. And I put only six techniques in here, six of the old techniques that we, uh, and some of them are still used today heavily. Actually, uh, two of the te techniques in here are probably the most popular techniques to do server-side push still. So we're gonna start with Java applets. How many of you are Java developers? I'm sorry. <laughs> so <laughs> Java applets. Java applets are Java programs that can run in the browser and you have to install the Java plugin, so don't do it. It's not good. Their users don't like it. They have to install something that's foreign and it typically breaks. I love Java on the server side. Java on the browser, not a good idea. So that was quick. Polling. Now this is the first legitimate technique that uses JavaScript to ask the server for something. And typically, we do it by asking repeatedly. Are we there yet? Where's my data? Where's my data? Where's my data? Where's my data? Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> so it's a very simple technique. We use the set interval function in JavaScript. Set interval basically says, run this function. Are we there yet? Every 1,000 milliseconds, or every second. And what you see is something like this. You ask for a request, nothing happens, you get no data. Or typically you get a message that says, there's no data for you. Then you, something happens on the server, let's say a record was inserted in the database, and then when you ask again, the server will tell you, yes, I have data for you, and here it is. 
So this is very chatty because you're asking for the data all the time. High traffic. A lot of networking support needed. So it's a self-inflicted denial, distributed denial of service attack. So you are really hacking your own system. It's not nice. Typically, you get fired for things like this. But it's a technique that we still use in some places. So polling, it's the last resource. If, if your user has a browser from 1995, then you probably have to go down to polling. So now let's talk about iframe streaming. In iframe streaming, it's a technique where we use an uh, HTML element called the iframe that every web developer hates. I hate iframes. Do you hate iframes? Thank you. You're my friends. <laughs> so iframe streaming relies, so yes, it, it makes you a sad panda because it's just another easy technique to implement. It's very buggy and very easy to break. So iframes, uh, and I'm going to show you a demo of it with uh, something called Sinatra, which is a Ruby a framework for web development, which makes the examples very short and simple. So with iframe, you had to embed an invisible iframe into a page. And that looks like this. I'm using uh, jQuery to create an iframe tag that it's going to ask with a get request for uh, something from the server. And I'm going to make it invisible. And I'm going to attach it to the body of the page. Once you have that, then on the server, you have to have the ability to stream data. So you can't just send one request. You have to send a request that's open, and the data flows all the way to the server. So with Ruby and Sinatra, I would do something like this. I, I respond to a GET request for that same URL. And I stream out some data. The data that I'm streaming out here, it's just a collection of words. So I'm showing, throwing words to the client. And uh, I'm going to send that as uh, a function called update progress. So I'm sending JavaScript to the client. When that JavaScript gets to the client, executes on the browser, and it does something on the page. So you, you now you're sending code that also carries the data. And I'm going to sleep for a second and a half in between uh, loops. Then my update progress is going to be JavaScript that changes something on the page based on the data that I'm sending. And uh, my update page, it's a script on the client side that is invoked by the data that I'm sending. In that way, I can uh, change values on the page. So let me quickly show you uh, this running demo. And you're going to notice that the drawback is that the browser loading icon, it's always running. So it, from a usability point of view, it's bad because it confuses users. But let's see that technique live. So I have a very simple application, and that's my wife sending me an IM. <laughs> and I have a button. When I click the button, and let me actually show you the data coming from the server. So let's see the networking stack working. When I click the kick it button, now you can see my long running requests. It's, I'm getting words being sent from the client. Notice. The trouble, it's always going. It's always going. It makes me dizzy. If we actually inspect the request, you can see that there is chunks of ex uh, JavaScript being sent and executed on the page and changing the contents of the page. The asterisk that you see in there, this at the beginning, it's all for IE. Otherwise, IE breaks. <laughs> OK, so that is iframe streaming. So it has some usability problems. So a better technique, it's XHR streaming. 
XHR streaming, it's also AJAX streaming. And it works similarly to iframe streaming, but without an iframe, which is a good thing. So in my iframe streaming, which is better than iframe, we use an AJAX call. So we send the requests on the background, we still open a stream on the server and send that data to the client. But now we don't set executable code. We don't send code and data together. We send only data. And the client decides how to deal with it. This is better because the other technique, it's bound to your current user interface implementation. If the page markup changes, you have to change the server with iframe streaming. Wh when you send it in JSON, the client can decide how to use the data. Obviously, if you change the data, the client has to know about those changes, but this is more maintainable and scalable. So with servers, uh, with uh, XHR or AJAX streaming, we again send a request, we stream it out, but this time we send the data only, not the code. And instead of uh, polling the server, the stream is open and we poll the stream in the client. So on the client, we're sending the request and then we have a timeout at which we actually parse any incoming data and then abort. And then we ask again. So this works really well if the frequency of the polling, so how often you poll your stream of data on the client, it's greater or equal than the rate that the server is sending the data. And there's no trouble, freak out. So your users are not confused. I don't know if uh, you might remember early techniques where it was a phantom click, where the page was just there and then something click magically, like a ghost, it really scare users, especially my mother. <laughs> All right, so the next technique I wanna talk about, it's long polling. In this one, it's used today very heavily. Long polling is the, def de uh, the default technique for any old browser. In long polling, it's similar to a short polling, but you wait longer. You basically ask the server block, says hold, hold, wait, 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 there's data. So when a server event occurs, you get your data. So polling works like this. Nothing there, something happens, we send you data. The request, it's open the whole time. So it's a long running request. That means that sometimes proxies and intermediate servers might close that connection for you. So long polling doesn't work in all environments. Uh, some cloud providers basically have, for example, a 30 second request limit. So you have to work within the boundaries of your provider. So I'm gonna skip this demo because it's very similar. And again, we're still sending a JSON. In this case, I was just reading a data file from the directory and actually changing the contents of a page when the file change. But I'm gonna skip this demo so we can actually get to the more fun demos. So at the end of the day, you basically send a message that reads the contents of a file to the browser. And on the server, you have an AJAX request uh, that it uh, times out in 10 seconds. So it, it waits for 10 seconds, and if you get data in those 10 seconds, you process the data. If not, you stop that request and you start a new one. So it's, are we there yet? <laughs> okay, and you change something on the page. Basically what you see is something like this on the browser. You see a request, it fails because there's no data. There's data, I process the data. Fail, 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 fail. There's data, I process the data. So the, the big issue with this is that you're blocking on the server. And when you block on the server, you're holding on to resources. So you're gonna need a lot of money to get a lot of Amazon servers to run your service. Oh, and I was using a text file as a database. That's a really bad thing too. So you have to have a server that support asynchronous responses to be able to not block and consume resources while you're idle waiting. 
in that busy I.O. checking loop, it's bad. It's almost like the are we there yet, but on the server now. So for improving this, we can use a, a, syn a synchronous system on the back end. And that means that now, instead of blocking, your server, uh, it's using like something like the reactor pattern to basically go through all the connections and uh, respond to the ones that actually can get data and not hold uh, in place. So it's not an infinite loop waiting for data. It's just event-based. So the data, it's available, an event triggers, and then you respond to that HTTP request. This is difficult to implement. It's hard. The server-side code is complex. The cloud-side code is complex. So typically, it's very uh, easy to break it. Now, the last technique I want to talk about, it's Flash streaming. Um, Macromedia Flash, Adobe Flash. Uh, how many of you like Flash? Good, you are still my friends. <laughs> <laughs> so Flash streaming, it relies on using an XML socket that is embedded in a single pixel Flash movie. So it's totally a hack. And I don't like Flash, so go away, Flash. That's a dodo bird. It's extinct. Flash should also be extinct. So now the reaction to all these problems with all the techniques that we have, it's that we created frameworks that can help us deal with them. And those frameworks are called push frameworks and typically are uh, under the umbrella called Comet. So you have Ajax, which is one type of soap, and then you have Comet, which is another type of soap. So Comet, it's not just long polling. It's long polling and trying all the techniques until you find one that works based on the browser capabilities. So it mixes all the techniques and it provides, the frameworks provide a client side and a server side component. So you don't have to write everything. It's more declarative. It's like using, uh, anybody use uh, JMS in Java? Java messaging service? It's almost like JMS. You subscribe and when a message is sent to a topic, you listen to that message, you get a, a notification. So it's a publish sus subscribe protocol, like JMX. It's uh, one of the most popular, it's called Biox. That's the protocol to do public subscribe with JavaScript and server-side components. And I'm gonna show you this demo, uh, which is a Comet demo using Fay. And Fay, it's a framework for doing uh, Comet. So what I have here, it's my simple chat client. And uh, normally I would let you play with this too, but since we have very little time, I'm gonna just do it uh, on my own in my, on my own machine, because I don't know if you could get to my IP address. So let me do this locally here so you guys can see what's going on. So I have one Chrome and one Firefox. I'm gonna sign in in this one as, uh, yeah, Tech Planet. that's a good name. And this is gonna be me. And I'm gonna join and create that room. And in here, it's gonna be again, Tech Planet. And it's gonna be my evil twin, Evil Brian. And now, when I send a message, the message appears on the other browser. So the communication, I created a topic. The topic, it's the name of the chat room. When a message goes to that chat room, all the listeners to that chat room get the message. So we can talk back and forth, and this is one simple way to implement chat in your applications. So that is a Comet framework at work. Okay. I really like Frank Sinatra, by the way. So with Faye, we have a publish uh, subscribe, and notice that the client 
I, I create a client endpoint, so all the messages go through that endpoint, and I create a subscription to a room. And then uh, I submit messages, I publish to the room, and when I listen, I listen to that room. So these techniques, uh, Comet Framework, again, they try all the techniques until they find one that works, okay? But that's still not enough. Now, everybody is probably excited about HTML5. It's been a while since we, they've been telling us about HTML5. One of the most um, cherished parts of HTML5 to me is something called WebSocket. So until now, we've been pushing when we need to pull. <laughs> So WebSockets, it's a new way to basically deal with this problem. In WebSocket, it's a real socket that provides two-way communications between the client and the server below HTTP. So HTTP, it's, it's at the TCP IP level. So HTTP traffic, it still works normally, but under that, you have a socket that actually it's used for communications between the client and the server. So now you have two-way communications, over a dedicated socket in a very simple way. Not the simplest, but simple enough. Uh, it deals well with security, proxies, and firewalls, which is an advantage over most of the other uh, techniques. So I'm gonna skip some of the code, and you can actually look at the code when you get home, but I wanna show you the demo quickly, and then I'll show you some of the other techniques. So I apologize for moving so fast through this. So for this demo, I have another Ruby program that uses WebSockets this time. And now I can go to my program. Let's make it a little smaller. And let's find the other browser. And now you can see WebSockets in action. So it's two-way communications and actually fine-grained communications. You can send a lot of data. It's much more efficient than just using HTTP. Uh, you can do things like this, drawing, uh, but you can also do simple messages. And if you find a good Comet framework, they probably will use WebSockets first if they're available. Sometimes it's hard to kill the server. <laughs> okay. Now, the last technique I want to talk to you about, it's uh, server sent events, or SSE for short. In server sent events, it's the twin sister of WebSockets. The difference is that it's one-way communication from the server to the client only. And it's pure HTTP. So it doesn't really reinvent, uh, it doesn't use sockets, so it's not as efficient as WebSockets, in my opinion, because it uses a higher level protocol like HTTP, but it's a very simple, very simple to implement. And if you only need to communicate one way, there's no two-way interface, uh, server sent events, it's probably the right choice. So for example, on the client, all you have to do is create something called an event source. This is a JavaScript API for server sent events. And it's a very simple API. You create an event source, and that event source is going to a URL on your server. Then you also listen to events coming from that event source. So the event listener that I'm creating is for the event timer. That means that the server can send messages with multiple types of events. This one that I'm looking for, it's called timer. When the event gets here, I'm gonna grab the data from the event, and I'm just gonna print it to the screen. On the server, it's also very easy, but you do have to use a non-blocking uh, asynchronous server. In uh, Ruby, we use something called Thin, uh, which is very uh, easy to use asynchronous web server. So with Thin, I can create my get request responder for the, the URL uh, TikTok, and I create a stream of data, and then every uh, one second, every second, 
I send the current date at time. And notice that the event name, it's timer. And this is what the client is looking for. I can send multiple different types of event. Maybe one is a timer for the clock. Maybe another one is for a, the position of a game uh, player somewhere else that doesn't interact with you. It's only a one-way communication. So maybe th how the background moves. So when you only need communications one way, server sent events, very, very simple. So let me show you the server sent event demo, and then we can do uh, questions and answers. So I have another demo here. It's always hard to remember the ports. <laughs> so here's my server sent event. And notice that my server is running, and it's sending every second the current date and time to the browser. Now let me show you also that uh, with curl so you can see really how it works. So here's a curl command that is also requesting the same data from my server. And here you can see that every time, this is a JSON data, I get the event timer with the data. And that's what my JavaScript is listening for. So again, a very simple technique, uh, much easier to implement than WebSockets, but again, only one way. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, the real techniques for you to use are long polling, web sockets, server sent events. If you can find a framework for your web framework that can do that, that's to me the best approach. Because you can satisfy older clients, devices that might not have web sockets enabled yet, uh, users that are using Internet Explorer, they would need long polling as a fallback. So what, what else are we missing? There's a couple of techniques that I didn't talk about. One of them is Bosch. Bosch, it's um, a peer-to-peer -peer technology. So the servers can talk to each other. As of recently, it hasn't gained too much traction. So there's not many people using it or talking about it anymore. So just keep your ear uh, tuned to see if something happens in there. The one that I'm really excited about, it's WebRTC. WebRTC, it's peer-to-peer -peer communications between browsers, no server, no server. So each browser can become its own server. So for example, let's say that you have an application where I have a set of uh, people that collaborate in my own project. It's a, let's say it's an issue tracker for a project X. Only the users that go to my page can actually directly talk to my browser, and my browser can be the server for Project X. Other person uses Project Y, only the users that use Project Y go to that person's browser as a server. So for a small number of users, you can turn your own browser into a server. So only your browser talks to a server, and all the other browsers collaborating with you talk to the browser directly. So it's a pretty impressive set of technologies. Uh, a lot of things to be seen of how people use it. Uh, I am sure that a lot of people would use it for bad things, where they can skip servers and uh, do illegal things, uh, but we'll see. <laughs> so WebRTC, very exciting technology. So what, what should you do? I say, again, use a framework. Use a framework for your language that satisfy your needs. But if you try to do it all from the ground up, Typically, you're going to end up reinventing the wheel and building your own Comet framework. So don't do that. So find a good framework. Uh, all the code is available on GitHub. Uh, there's a URL, and I will probably have an article, uh, not in Korean. Someday I will learn Korean. Uh, but you can actually go to my website and get all that information. <laughs>